Well, thank you all for coming this morning. Uh, the weather's not the best, so I really, really appreciate you guys making the effort to be here. Uh, my name is John Remus. I'm the chief of the Water Management Division at the, at the Missouri River Basin Water Management Division in Omaha, Nebraska. Uh, our office is responsible for regulating the uh, six main stem Missouri River projects. Um, we've got uh, meeting materials on the table, uh, agenda, copies of the slides that you're going to be seeing today. Does anybody need a copy of the slides or the agenda? Okay. No, but, um, Ed, can we get a? Co oh, we, oh, we have copies of the slides. Okay, we got. Them. Thank you. Um, are we okay. <clears throat> the purpose of this meeting is to discuss the status of the the main stem system uh, as its state as it I guess as it was Monday. Well, it may have changed a little bit over the last few days. Um, we're going to talk about uh, different uh, operational scenarios that, uh, that we've uh, uh, analyzed in our, in our AOP, uh, AOP report. So if we're here to discuss that, what we are not here to discuss is litigation. There's a number of lawsuits in the basin. A couple of them have to do with the operation of our projects. Uh, those pro those uh, uh, court cases are, are ongoing, so we're not going to be answering questions or making comments about that. It's core policy not to do that, and uh, so we're not going to be answering questions. We will, uh, during this, this time of the lawsuits, we are going to continue to meet our statutory obligations and operate the Missouri River system for its authorized purposes, uh, as described in our master manual, and as uh, we will con comply with all the laws, including the Dangerous Species Act and the, biological, the 2003 biological opinion. I want to assure everyone in the basin that the Corps remains fully committed to our flood risk reduction mission and protecting stakeholders when we can from significant runoff events that pose a threat to human health or safety. So uh, that's, uh, that's where we're standing today. Uh, you may have heard about litigation. You may be interested in that. We're just not going to be able to talk about it. There's also on the, on the table, in addition to the agenda and the slides, there's comment cards or comment sheets. Uh, if you want to fill out one of those and, uh, and give it to us, that's fine. Uh, we also have uh, there uh, statement cards. If you're going to ask a question or give a statement, we'd ask you to fill these out. We'll uh, call on these first in the order. Uh, this helps us keep track of, uh, you know, not only just who attended, but uh, who asked what questions so we get it uh, attributed to the right person uh, in our note taking. So, uh, you can provide public or comments here. You can also uh, email us comments. Uh, our email address is on a business card out there, or you can just send us something in the mail. Uh, we'll, uh, we'll accept comments anyway, either way. Um, we're here to listen to your thoughts, your concerns, and we'll answer your questions as best we can. We may not have the answer for you today, but we'll, uh, we'll follow up on that. Before we go any further, I'd like to introduce some staff members. From my staff, we have Kevin Brody, who's uh, our team leader for our ResReg team, Mike Swenson, who is our power production team leader, Ed Clary is uh, our admin support tech, and if you need anything, uh, raise your hand, Ed will get it for you. Eileen Williamson is from our division public affairs office here. And from the uh, Oahe project today, we have uh, Eric Stosh, who is the operations manager here. And from his staff, we have uh, Sharon Lodge, Shannon Lodge, excuse me, and Matt Golden. Uh, are there any other core employees that? We just picked up Scott Wick and Jackie Bolson. Scott Wick and Jackie Bolson. Okay. Um, We were going to have a gentleman here from the National Weather Service, but he's in Aberdeen and didn't, didn't want to make the drive over today. So we'll do 
due to the weather, so he's not going to be here. Are there any other federal agencies, uh, representatives in the crowd that uh, would like to be recognized? I'd also like to recognize elected officials. Are there any uh, representatives of Congress or their representatives here that would like to be recognized? Thank you. Anyone else? Yes. Kim Olson was Senator Rounds Office. Rebecca Herman was Senator Rounds Office. Okay. Any other congressional representatives or their How about uh, tribal officials? Any tribal officials that want to be recognized here? Yes, sir. What's that? Uh, Ron Blacksmith, manager, Treatment Plan. Any other tribal officials or representatives? How about state and local government officials that would like to be recognized? Tina Titsi, Office of Emergency Management for the state. Steve Harding, the mayor of Pier. Anyone else? Uh, meeting format is uh, going to go. Uh, Kevin and Mike are going to give a PowerPoint presentation that uh, goes over the, the status of the system as it is and, and our planned operations. Um, after that, uh, we'll have our question and answer. We'll start with the people that are, we'll start with congressmen and uh, their representatives and other elected officials, and then we'll go through the people that fill out of cards, and then we'll uh, take it just uh, the, the general crowd after that. Uh, I would ask you to hold your questions till after the presentation. Uh, that, uh, get all the information out there. You may have more or less questions. Uh, sometimes you might have a question in Kevin's presentation that Mike will answer in his or vice versa. So uh, uh, we ask that you hold your questions at the end. With that, I think I'm going to turn the uh, presentation over to Kevin Grody. Thank you. Does that help? You can see those slides a little bit better, I hope. Um, I think, I'm not sure if John mentioned, but if you do have a uh, written statement that you're giving, if you could give that to us, we would appreciate that. That will go into our notes, and, and then you don't have to depend on our note-taking skills, so, uh, which sometimes uh, is not what you are really trying to say, so we'd appreciate that. <coughs> Uh, so as John mentioned, uh, my name is Kevin Grody, I'm the Reservoir Regulation Team Lead. And uh, this presentation is going to take hopefully less than 15 or 20 minutes, uh, and then we can get to the question and answer period. But I think it's important for us to, to tell you where we're at and what we're doing and, and how we're doing it. Uh, it might uh, help you understand the decisions that we're making. Uh, as I'm sure everybody in this room knows, this is the Missouri River Basin. It's 530,000 square miles. Uh, and in it we have the Missouri River, 2,321 miles long, which makes it the longest river in the United States. In case you run into somebody who lives along the Mississippi River, longest river is the Missouri River. Um, and on the Missouri River we have the six main stem projects. Uh, Fort Peck, Garrison, Hawaii, Big Bend, Fort Randall, and Gavin's Point. Uh, we, the lower 735 miles of the Missouri River, which uh, starts at the uh, mouth of the Big Sioux River near Sioux City, uh, that is the navigation channel. So as John mentioned, the, the mission of our office is to regulate those six main step projects for eight congressionally authorized purposes. In no particular order, those purposes are flood control, navigation, hydropower, water supply, fish and wildlife, which includes the threatened and endangered species, irrigation, water quality control, and recreation. Each time we make a regulation decision at one of those six projects, we consider all eight authorized purposes. This is a new graph. For some of you who have been to our public meetings in the past, uh, we've added this one uh, based on some of the comments that we, see, we received at one of our public meetings. Because one of the questions that came up during that, that uh, meeting was, how much of the basin, you said it's 530,000 square miles, but how much of that is actually regulated 
by federal projects. And so this graph is, is intended to depict that. Uh, so we start with Fort Peck. And that's about 60,000 square miles, uh, pretty much up in Montana. And we have Garrison, 123,000 square miles. Uh, in much of that area, my, my, excuse me, Montana, Wyoming, and even part of Canada. And then we have Owyhee, uh, Fort Randall, and Ga uh, Big Bend, and then finally Gavin's Point. So this area in purple is what the main stem system regulates, and then there's tributary projects along some of the tributaries uh, in that basin. But all told, 200, about 280,000 square miles is regulated by the main stem system. Now the Omaha district regulates the tributary projects and outside of this purple area there are some areas in um, Colorado, Wyoming, and North Dakota that the Omaha district regulates and then the Kansas City district regulates the tributary projects uh, on the Kansas River system and the Osage River system. Uh, so this is in that, uh, I guess that's tan or yellow. So we look at these three colors, and that is what the federal dam system regulates within the Missouri River Basin. What it does not regulate is all these areas here. This is unregulated. So whatever falls onto the ground, whatever melts from the snow, comes into the rivers, makes its way to the Missouri River. We show this graph to really depict how large the reservoirs are. For you folks, you already know how big Lake Oahe is, but for many folks, um, especially in the lower basin, I don't think they really appreciate how enormous Lake Oahe, uh, Lake Sakakawea, and Fort Peck Lake are. They are tremendously large projects, and they were designed that large to get us to long extended droughts. In particular, the 1930 to 1941 drought uh, back in the Depression era to get us through a long extended drought so that we have a, a reliable water supply uh, during those dry periods. And so this graph actually depicts all of the Corps of Engineers reservoirs in the lower 48 states. And you can see where uh, Fort Peck, Garrison, and Oahe just dwarf all the other projects. And, and that's why they sometimes get the name the Big Three when we start talking about our, our reservoir system. So you're going to hear us talk, and maybe if you've seen some of the things on our website or you listen to some of our webinars, we use the term system storage. And, and what we're referring to is that the six projects, they are individual projects, but when we make a regulation decision, we are often making a regulation decision at multiple projects. Uh, if I were to make a regulation decision at Gavin's Point, we would have to make one at Fort Randall, at Big Bend, and Oahe, and perhaps all the way up to Fort Peck, because we operate those six projects as a system. Uh, and so this graph were to, were to depict if you took all of those reservoirs and put them into one, because some of our decisions are based on what is the total storage in all of the reservoirs. So there's four zones when we look at that. We have the lower zone, which is the permanent pool zone. That's the minimum amount of water we need in the reservoir system to operate for purposes such as uh, hydropower. Then we have this carryover multiple use zone, and it is the largest zone in the system, and that is to get us through those long extended droughts. The last drought ended in 2007, and that's when we hit our historic minimum storage in the system. I'm going to skip this one, and I'm going to come back to it. And then we have this upper zone, which is the exclusive flood control zone. And just as the name implies, when we are in that zone, we are operating exclusively for flood control. So this last zone, which is the annual flood control and multiple use zone, is ideally where we would like to be 365 days out of the year. When we are in this zone, we are providing optimum benefits to all of those eight authorized purposes. This is where we're at right now. We're about 3 million acre feet into this 16.3 million acre feet of designated flood control storage. So we take those four zones and then we apply them to each one of the projects. 
I'm only showing four of the projects here. Uh, Gavin's Point and Big Bend are pretty much run of the river projects. Whatever comes in pretty much goes out. It's really the, the Big Three and Fort Randall that have uh, flood control storage in them. So I'm just showing those four. And, and just like I showed with the previous graph, you can see where it, each of those four reservoirs were a few feet into each of their respective annual flood control and multiple use zones. So I'm going to switch gears here and I'm going to talk about runoff. Uh, and the important thing to remember about runoff is that there are three components to runoff. There's plains snowpack, there's mountain snowpack, and there's rainfall runoff. We're going to talk about each one of them. So the plains snowpack normally comes off in March and April, and in previous years, uh, it's been coming off in January and February, but not in 2018. Uh, it has been a long, cold winter. I don't need to tell you that. You've lived through it. Uh, but this has been uh, when the plain snow has just continued into uh, April period. But during March and April, during that two-month period, we normally see about 25% of the annual runoff into the upper basin. When I say upper basin, it's above Sioux City, Iowa. Mountain snowpack accumulates from November and sometimes late October, usually until mid-April. And then it starts melting out, and then we see that runoff in May, June, and July. We also get precipitation during those months. So during May, June, and July, we normally see 50% of the annual runoff into this, the upper basin. So in this five month period, March, April, May, and June, March, April, May, June, and July, we would normally see about 75% of the total runoff into the upper basin. And during the other seven months of the year, the other 25% comes in. Our forecast, and we just updated this uh, on uh, Monday, we call it a mid-month check. A lot of things happened over the weekend. You know that. There's a lot of snow that came through Nebraska and, and uh, South Dakota. And uh, we decided we need to assess what our forecast is looking like. We did a, what we call a mid-month check. We increased our forecast to 33 million acre feet, which is 130% of average. So I'm going to step through each one of those runoff components. So I'm going to start with plain snowpack. Now this was as of, actually this was as of Monday. So that's, that's correct, April 16th. This shows, now if you were to look at this two or three weeks ago, you would have seen a lot of shades of blue uh, in, in Montana. There was a significant amount of snowfall that occurred in Montana. And I, I gotta point out, for some of you who haven't been to one of these meetings before, this graph represents inches of water equivalent. Sometimes we call it snow water equivalent. It's, it's the liquid content in the snow. If you took a bucket of snow, put it in your garage and let it melt, the amount of water that's left over, that's the liquid content. So this is what that represents. Um, so over the last couple of weeks, what we've seen is a lot of that snow in Montana melting off. We still have some really up in Canada and, and very uh, northern part of Montana still to melt off. And we have some here uh, in, uh, above the Jamestown and Pikestown Reservoirs um, in, in over in central North Dakota. What we got over this weekend was this tremendous blizzard that shut down I-90 and I-80. Um, we still have some of that snow, but uh, we've already seen that some of it has already melted off. We're seeing that already in the Big Sioux River, the James River, the Vermilion River, We're integrating that into our forecasts. Um, but I do understand there may be even more coming. Sorry about that. And then mountain snowpack, so that second component of runoff. Now I know that folks have looked at the mountain snowpack and they've looked at what happened in 2011 and they see that correlation and I, I will agree with you. When it comes to mountain snowpack, 
there is a, a similarity between 2011 and 2018. But I simply want to say that there are three components to runoff. Mountain snowpack is very similar to what occurred in 2011. And then precipitation, that third component of runoff. Now, when you look at this graph, when I first put it on there, I thought I'd put the same graph on there because they look so similar. But this one is actually what's occurred over the last 90 days. This one's what's occurred over the last 30 days. And in both, you can see that the, the dark or the purples and blues are above normal, and the, the browns and reds are below normal. The upper basin has received above normal precipitation over the last 90 days, as well as the last uh, 30 days. Um, you really kind of kind of look for where our state is right now that we're in. But uh, South Dakota is around here. Nebraska is right here. Uh, you kind of have to look for the, the outline of the state. I apologize. It's it's not our product, um, but um, it is very valuable for us if you can find it. Find your way in there. Uh, but the point here of making is that the lower basin has been fairly dry over the last 90 days and 30 days, and that has allowed us to be fairly aggressive with the releases that we're making out of the system because we know that plain snow is going to melt, we know it has been melting, and we know that mountain snow is going to melt. And then we also built into our forecast the precipitation outlooks, uh, and this is another product that the National Weather Service puts together for us. Um, now, I will caveat this whole thing saying that this is produced on the third Thursday of every month, and the third Thursday of April is tomorrow. So we're looking at a product that is about 29 days old. It's going to look different tomorrow. Um, so what we were seeing last month, or what the National Weather Service was seeing last month, is that there is a slightly higher probability of above normal precipitation in the upper basin. Um, but as we get into the, the lower basin, it's this called, what's called equal chances. So what really they're saying is there's an equal chance for below normal, equal chance for normal, equal chance for above normal. Uh, when we look further out into July, August, and September, almost the entire basin is what is in that equal chances. And then finally, the drought conditions. And again, if we want to look at and compare 2011 and 2018, one of the biggest differences between 2011 and 2018 is that in 2011, we had gone through three very high runoff years, three years of, of high plains of snowpack in 2009, 2010, and 2011. And, and the soils were very, very wet, very saturated when the plain snow was melting off. In 2018, that is not the case. Uh, much of the upper basin was in drought conditions um, going into the winter and through the winter. And what we're seeing right now, and, and you'll see it more when, when Mike gives his presentation, is that while the plain snow has melted, and there was significant plain snow, we're not seeing a lot of that being realized in the reservoirs. And, and it is our belief that a lot of that runoff from the plain snow is infiltrating into those dry soils. And again, this, this one's fairly old. It was released March 15th, again, the third Thursday of the month. This one's going to be updated tomorrow. So this one may show differently as far as the drought outlook. Uh, this one was actually updated just last week. We can still see that uh, most of the Dakotas and, and eastern Montana uh, are in some sort of um, dry soil uh, condition. So then we talk about that 33 million that I talked about that, that we did this mid-month check as far as runoff in the upper basin. And what we want to do is compare that historically. And we have 120 years of record that we compare that against. So we go all the way back to 1898. And so the, what I'd like to point to, here we are right here, 2018, 33. And what I'd like to point out to folks is when I look at this graph, what I see is tremendous variability. Um, the, the upper basin can be very wet one year. It can be very dry the next year. 
And, and during that 120 years that we have, we can see that there have been four times where we've had extended droughts uh, in the upper basin, but we've also had years where it's been very wet. So one of the things we do is we take that, that runoff forecast, that 33 million that I talked about, and we break it up by month. In fact, we even break it up by reach. Um, that's, that's a little bit too, many, too much information to put on one graph. So we just show how we're breaking it up by month. So the red is the long-term average, going all the way back to 1898. The blue is what has already occurred, and the yellow is what we're forecasting. So we're going to start in January here. Now, we did have significant plain snow. We did have some warm days in January. Some of that plain snow did melt off, uh, and that's where you're seeing above normal runoff in January. February was pretty cold. We didn't see a whole lot of plain snow melt off in February. March, we had some warm days that melted off. This April, you can see where we were forecasting it um, quite a bit above normal. That's the remaining plain snow that we expect to be melting off in the next couple of weeks. And then when you look into May, June, and July, you can see how we have them above average in each one of those months. That's really a reflection of what would that above average mountain snowpack. And then as we get into August and September, all the way through December, it's pretty much closer to average, and that's really reflective of that EC, that equal chances that I was talking about regarding precipitation. So one of the things that we do, and, and it's, a, it's a somewhat complicated topic to, to do, I try to describe, but um, it's called service level. And it is not a release from a project, um, but it is a rate of flow. Uh, during normal uh, conditions, we would have a service level of 35,000 CFS. And that is, the, that is the amount of water that would, if, that would meet the authorized purposes in the lower river. Um, when we see conditions, like we are seeing now, with above normal uh, runoff being forecasted in the upper basin, uh, we look to start the process of flood evacuation as soon as conditions permit. So in mid-March, we increase that service level 5,000. At the beginning of April, we increased it another 5,000. And on Monday, we yet increased it another 5,000. So that service level increase right now is at 15,000. It has been fairly dry in the lower basin, so that impact of the extra 15,000 isn't really being um, impacting any of those other authorized purposes, such as navigation or water supply. Uh, but what it is allowing us to do is, is begin that evacuation because we know we're going to have a high runoff here. And, and we're lengthening the time that we have uh, to, to make those flood storage evacuations. So we have now, we still have May, June, July, August, September, October, November. If we can extend that period, that means that we have to not go up as high uh, later in the fall and, and summer. Um, this also provides us flexibility to reduce releases when we need to. In fact, what an example right now is that we are going to reduce releases out of Gavin's Point um, for about a week, we believe. That's what today's forecast is indicating. Because all this snow that we received over this weekend, well, it's finding its way to the river now, to the Big Sioux River, to the James River, to the Vermilion River, to the Little Sioux River, which are all unregulated rivers. And that is, of course, finding its way to the Missouri River. We're reducing our releases to, to offset the peak downstream. When that water finds its way beyond, down the river, then we'll increase Gavin's Point back up, where we can continue on with that flood evacuation. All of this is contained within our master manual. And hands up, how many people have read the master manual? OK, pretty much typical response. Um, but it is all in there, and that is on our website. So if you want to do some fact checking, um, you can go and look at plate 6-1 in our master manual, and you'll see that how we decide that service level is increased is based on three things. How much water do we have currently stored 
in the reservoir system? How much does the Bureau of Reclamation have stored in their reservoir system? And how much are we forecasting for runoff for the remainder of the year? That gives us the guidance as to how we should be uh, in evacuating floodwaters at what rate, at what point of the year. So again, uh, the service level adjustment has been at 15,000. I kind of already talked that. Um, but we will continue checking this. We're going to check it on May 1. We're going to check it on uh, May 15. And it's not like we go on vacation. We are constantly looking um, throughout. We are on in, in the office. So someone is in the office seven days a week at our office. We are running the forecast seven days a week, 365 days a year. We are monitoring what's going on. We are con con constantly talking to folks out in the field, such as Eric and Scott, uh, to assess what the situations are. We make adjustments as needed. We try to keep you informed as much as we can. How many people here look at our weekly brief on our website? We put every Tuesday. Oh, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> That's good to know. Um, and I encourage folks, if you really want to know what we're doing, you know, that is one place where, where we try to keep you informed. It's only one page. We hope to fill it with relevant information. We want to keep you informed. You always have the option of calling us and asking us directly as to what you're doing. Um, if you haven't been to our website, go to our website. Um, it's not the easiest thing to get around, uh, but we try to put all the information out there uh, so you, you stay informed of what's going on and what we plan to do. With that, I will turn it over to Mike. Okay, thanks, Kevin. Again, I'm Mike Swenson, one of the team leaders in the Water Management Office. I'm going to talk about the expected results for the authorized purposes in 2018. Uh, before we go into those authorized purposes, I want to talk a little bit about our current regulation forecast. This slide here shows the system storage uh, in million acre feet. The black line here is the actual system storage going back to the beginning of 2017. And then you can see these other three uh, lines here that start in on April 1st here. The blue line is what we call the basic forecast and that's based in this case on the April 1st runoff forecast. We also run a wetter condition and a drier condition uh, to give us a range of uh, possible releases and elevations. And we refer to those as the upper basic and the lower basic forecast. Um, now, as Kevin mentioned, we did update the runoff forecast uh, kind of before we left the office on Monday. So we didn't completely get that um, reflected in these slides. So I'll try to point out some of those things as I go here. Um, you'll also see on this slide the three green triangles in the typical type year. The first one here would set the navigation, that's the March 15th storage check, that would set the navigation service level for the first half of the navigation season. Uh, during a normal year, the July 1st storage check would set the navigation service level for the second half of the season, and also the season length. And then the September 1st storage check would set the Gavin's Point winter release level. Since we're in um, at a raised service level now, those don't come into play uh, as much as they would in a normal year. Um, so again, going back to look at the black line, which is actual system storage, you can see we, we see that pattern that Kevin talked about earlier. We started last year right at the base of the annual flood control zone. We captured water during the year, the plain snow and the mountain snow, and then that water was evacuated uh, throughout the remainder of the year until we started this year again right at the base of the annual flood control zone. You can see the black line here now is climbing and that's an indication that we're capturing that plain snowpack. And then if we were to follow this blue line, you would again see it continue to climb from the plain snow and then the mountain snow and we would evacuate that water through the remainder of the year. With our updated runoff forecast um, and the updated service level, the shape of this line is not going to change a whole lot. We'll be releasing more water from the reservoirs than we had on our earlier forecast, so that will offset uh, some of the increase in runoff. This uh, line here, which I think was about 63 million acre feet, is about 64 probably on the new forecast. 
and so it would come up a little slightly different. But the overall shape and et cetera of the line is not going to change a lot. With that, we would still have some uh, storage available uh, for unexpected runoff. Uh, as Kevin mentioned, we've uh, had some similar or inquiries about the similarities, particularly with the mountain snowpack being uh, close to 2011. Um, so on this slide now, I've added the 2011 system storage. And again, this is a little hard to see, but you can look at your hand out there. Here's the black line right here. That's where we are this year. Here's where we were in 2011. The difference between those storages is uh, roughly 5 million acre feet. So we have more storage available now than we had in 2011. That 5 million acre feet is roughly about a third of the total flood storage from this 56.1 that Kevin talked about up to the top of the exclusive at 72.4. So 5 million acre feet, big difference between where we're at now and where we were in 2011. Uh, similar uh, charts in, in your handout and also on the slides here for the individual reservoirs. These show reservoir elevations rather than storage. And I won't go into detail on each one of these this one's four pack. Here's Garrison. And since we're in Pierre here, I'll stop uh, on Oahe here and uh, talk about this little. Again, you can see the similar to the earlier chart. The black line is actual. This is reservoir elevation. Now you can see last year we uh, essentially dipped to the base of the annual flood control zone, captured some water during the year, and then that water was evacuated. This dip over the winter or late into the fall and winter is somewhat typical. That gives us a little bit of uh, extra boost in winter hydropower energy. Now you can see again, we're capturing runoff here uh, during the plain snow melt. So the line's coming up um, and then the blue line again, so that's the April 1st forecast. The new forecast, that should look actually quite similar. Maybe in some regards it might be lower in the sense that we've now expanded the service level and we're increasing the uh, number of months of evacuation. So then moving on to the individual project purposes, this one is flood control. As you saw in the earlier slides, all 2007 flood water was evacuated by the res from the reservoir system by mid-January. And Kevin's already gone into detail on in, in covering the service level increases, which we did in mid-March, early April, and mid-April, uh, in fact, Monday. And Kevin already mentioned that we would make additional adjustments if needed in this service level. Um, you also saw in the previous slide that we still do have storage space available to capture runoff and reduce releases for downstream events. Uh, that's downstream of Gavin's and would be downstream of the other projects as well. Um, it's important to note that flooding can still occur uh, due to rainfall events, particularly downstream of Gavin's Point. Our ability to re reduce stages diminishes as you move downstream from Gavin's Point due to the increased travel time and the uncontrolled drainage area. Uh, just an example is in terms of travel time, the travel time from Gavin's Point to uh, Kansas City is roughly uh, five and a half to six days. And then you saw in the earlier slide, Kevin showed that uncontrolled drainage area below the system of reservoirs, a large area. Uh, hydropower, this slide uh, shows main stem generation since 1954. Hydropower is largely uh, influenced by the runoff that we get through the system. You can see the last several years we've had a uh, fairly normal uh, uh, generation from the system with uh, you know, somewhat normal runoff conditions. You can see that during the last drought from 2000 to 2008, system generation was down. Our forecast for this year's hydropower generation is 11.5 billion kilowatt hours. Again, a reflection of the higher uh, runoff forecast, so we'll be moving more water through the system. Uh, navigation, and I talked about those storage checks for navigation earlier. Um, they won't come into play as much this year. Flow support for the first half of navigation season is at that elevated service level, 15,000 CFS above, so full service flows. We'll make additional adjustments if we need to, to that. Um, so just as an example here, these are the revised target flows down the down 
extreme part of the river. So just for example, Sioux City's normal full service navigation target would be 31,000. We've upped that to 46,000 and these uh, other locations, Omaha, Nebraska City, and Kansas City also increased their 15,000 CFS on their normal uh, flow targets. Flow support for the second half of the navigation season, again, typically we would do a storage check on July 1st. Uh, this year, that would likely be driven by the uh, evacuation of water from the system. So above full service, flow support is likely uh, as we move through the rest of the season. And then a 10-day a season length extension is likely. That 10-day extension gives us a little bit more time to evacuate water. Uh, on the back end of what would be the normal uh, navigation flow support. Water supply, water quality, irrigation and recreation, these uh, four project purposes all require access to water. Again, with that higher runoff forecast, we'd have above average elevations and releases uh, at the projects. Uh, we wouldn't expect there would be any impacts to irrigation and, and recreation from this. Um, in terms of water supply, kind of looking out into next winter here, um, and again, this is based on the April 1st forecast. Gavin's Point re winter releases of 20,000 CFS under the basic and upper basic forecast. That's slightly higher than the normal winter release of a, roughly 17,000. Again, that gives us a little bit more time to evacuate water from the system uh, during these high runoff years. Uh, on that April 1st forecast, we did show winter releases of 13,500 under the lower basic runoff. I expect when we update the uh, reservoir simulations that that's probably going to be higher than that based on our new uh, runoff numbers. Um, with these higher flows from Gavin's Point during the, the winter, we wouldn't expect any uh, access issues on the lower part of the river. Uh, fish and wildlife, uh, in the annual operating plan, we laid out that we would uh, try to have steady to rising pools at the upper three reservoirs during the forage fish spawn. And if we didn't have enough runoff, then we would favor garrison this year. Now it looks like with the runoff forecast that we have, this probably isn't going to be an issue. Although if we are able to up Gavin's Point releases quite a bit and we get a little bit of lull between plain snow and when the mountain snow comes back in, Potentially there's maybe an issue there, but um, likely not with the extra runoff that's going to be in the system. Um, we'll also minimize periods of zero release at Fort Randall to the extent possible during the turn and plover nesting season. And again, with the elevated flows from the system, this likely isn't going to be an issue uh, going into this summer. And then lastly, we'll talk about the regulation for the threatened and endangered species start with the regulation for the piping plover and the lease turn. Um, in, in most years at Gavin's Point during the uh, turn of plover, plover nesting season, which starts about mid-May, we would do what we call a steady release flow to target. So at the beginning of the nesting season, we would start flows up a little bit to uh, have a little higher flow during the first part of the nesting season to keep the birds nesting up. And then if we have to later in the season as the downstream tributary flows drop off, then we would increase releases or flow to target as necessary. Um, again, this year, since we're trying to expand the uh, period of evacuation of water from Gavin's Point, it's likely that um, that will be the driver for releases during the nesting season and not so much uh, what we would typically do. Um, intraday peaking patterns or hourly peaking patterns at Garrison and Fort Randall are something we typically do during the nesting season. Uh, that gives us some hydropower peaking, but also gives us consistent stages uh, downstream of those two projects for, uh, on the sandbars for the birds that nest there. Um, in terms of Garrison, since we'll have higher flows than we normally were, the uh, range of that peaking pattern is going to be a little bit less. We'll be doing a little bit uh, because they'll be running more flows out uh, during the off hours. So that will have a little bit less fluctuation, but there will still will likely be some peaking there. Fort Randall, they're currently doing uh, maintenance on some of the units, and that combined with our higher flows from Fort Randall mean that we probably won't have a peaking pattern this year. 
uh, from Fort Randall. This run basically steady releases uh, for most of the summer, except for those periods where we have to reduce uh, releases to correspond to Gavin's point changes. And then we'll continue to do measures to minimize take uh, for the turns and plumbers. And then last, uh, talked about the bimodal spring pulse for the pallet sturgeon, which was part of the amended biological opinions, a reasonable and prudent alternative. Obviously, March and May spring pulses not implemented in 2018. The Corps is currently pursuing the independent science uh, advisory panel's uh, recommendation, which includes development of a Missouri River management plan. And so we're foregoing spring pulses while that process is taking place. The management plan final EIS is expected in uh, fall of 2018. And so just to summarize then, uh, Kevin obviously covered the above average runoff forecast and then we showed obviously some higher reservoir levels, uh, higher than average. And, and we talked about the reservoir releases being uh, higher than average. So with that, I'll turn it back to John. If any of you have uh, uh, cards you want to be called on, uh, kind of pass them to the end and Ed will uh, pick them up. So. <laughs> that concludes our presentation and we'll turn it over to the comment period. Uh, we'll start with members of Congress. If there's a member of Congress or a representative that would like to make a statement or ask a question. Uh, any tribal? Oh, yeah. And you, when you, if you state your name so that we can get that. Yep. Um, I'm Kim Olson with Senator Rounds' office here in Pierre, and I think as many of you know, Senator Rounds has been monitoring this very, very closely since mid-February, early March. Um, we are encouraged, and it, it is a positive, as this presentation pointed out, that we have less water in storage in the system than we did in 2011. Um, as you guys know, um, in 2011 at this time we had roughly 64 million acre feet of water in the system and right now today we have that 59 million acre feet. So the fact that there's less storage in the system is positive. Um, but that said, and as we all know, we're continuing to get precipitation. Much of South Dakota and the Missouri River Basin is still covered in snow. Even today it continues to snow. And so this is something that we need to be vigilant about. We need to continue to watch. Um, even more concerning is that Senator Rounds did send in a request for further management practice information um, in early March and still has not heard a response to that request. And so that continues to be a concern of the Senator. But um, that said, he's going to continue to monitor. And I think that you guys have seen the daily updates that he's been putting up and on our website. If you have any questions about those, you're always welcome to call. We are monitoring it closely. And should it come to that, he does have oversight authority of the Corps of Engineers and it does have the ability to call hearings if we would have further questions. Um, so let us know if there's anything that you have questions for our office about. Thank you. Any other congressional members or their uh, tribal members or their representatives, would you like to ask a question or make a statement? Uh, state representatives, either legislative representative or government representatives. Yes, sir. Good morning, I'm John Lott. I'm the Aquatic Resources Chief with uh, South Dakota Department of Game, Fish, and Parks. And uh, a, a letter of comment will be submitted uh, formally by mail for General Spellman from Secretary Hepler uh, from Game Fish and Parks and Secretary Perner from Environment and Natural Resources. That will be in the mail this week. Besides that, I have some comments, some informal comments to share with the Corps today that will uh, touch on some of the points in that letter so that the, uh, the audience here today is able to hear that. So, start with, we appreciate the <coughs> The efforts the Corps has made in, in improving communications with other federal, state, and local entities throughout the fall and the winter months to ensure awareness of basic conditions. With the high mountain snowpack this year and the occurrence of late spring storms, we ask that the Corps be diligent in its efforts to keep Missouri River Basin stakeholders and states informed of the status of water storage and yield and 
the reservoir system this spring and summer. In regards to high water levels experienced in the Pier and Fort Pier area this past summer, we would like the Corps to perform a post-flood channel morphometry study to determine if the 2011 flood significantly changed the channel characteristics and capacity. We request that funds for the study be included in the Corps' 2020 federal budget request. We recommend the Corps develop and implement a, a plain snowpack and soil moisture monitoring program in the Upper Missouri Basin as was authorized by Congress in Section 4003 of the Water Resource Development Act of 2014. Section 1179 of the Water Resources Development Act of 2016 designated the Corps as a lead agency for this program and we request that, that funds for implementation of the program be included in the Corps' a 2020 federal budget request. We appreciate the comment, we appreciate the commitment the Corps has made uh, towards working with the tribes in South Dakota to protect historic and cultural resources under the 2004 uh, programmatic agreement for operation and management of the Missouri River Main Stem System. In the past, uh, the river reached below Fort Randall has experienced periods of dewatering due to the on and off cycling of water releases for power generation. We recognize that the Corps in the Western Area Power Administration have made efforts to reduce this practice. In fact, this past summer, there was a marked decrease in the cycling between high and low releases from the dam. We hope this practice continues and from the presentation this morning it's obvious that that will be the case this year. We support the course. A proposed intent to favor Lake Sakakawea during the 2018 spring fish spawning period. Although if conditions allow rising pools on the three upper reservoirs during the spring fish spawning period would be ideal. We also request that uh, the state be contacted if a drawdown of Francis uh, case is planned in that spring spawning period. The reason being that Francis case is the most consistent uh, walleye fishery we have in the state of South Dakota. And uh, helping ensure that the conditions are right for a good spawn and walleye recruitment are important. We also formally request that a mechanism be built into the annual AOP process to breed state fish and wildlife and water management agencies on the current status of conditions of the Missouri River system and initial plans for the following year. And this occur before work on the draft AOP begins each August. We want to take this opportunity to reiterate that South Dakota does not support the Corps' policy regarding water storage agreements uh, prior to granting access easements for new water diversion intakes. We believe the direction the Corps is taking in regards to the reallocation study, the surplus water reports, and the proposed rulemaking is an illegal taking of state water rights by denying access to the natural flows of the Missouri River. In March of 2017, the Governor Dugard submitted his formal comments concerning the proposed rule, stating this proposed rule is unacceptable to South Dakota. We believe the Corps should abandon the efforts of the surplus water studies, the reallocation reports, and proposed rulemaking and lift the moratorium on issuing a pump access easements by rescinding real estate guidance a policy letter a number 26. This would allow users who have obtained state water rights to pump water without further federal interference. But again, I thank you today for coming to Pier on behalf of the Departments of Environment, Natural Resources, and Game, Fish, and Parks. We appreciate this opportunity to come. Thank you. 
Thanks. All right. Uh, any other state officials who would like to make a statement? <clears throat> All right. Uh, does anybody have a card filled out that they haven't handed in yet? Oh, how about, uh, excuse me, local county or city officials? Yes, sir. Thank you. I, you said that uh, I'm Steve Harding, the mayor of Pierre. Um, you said that you've increased uh, three times now, it's like 5,000 was released, and it's for a total of 50,000. Where does that put you now, total release from the lot? We're at 38,000 right now out of one. I'm sorry, out of Gavin's point, we're at 38,000. Oahe's releases are roughly 32,000. 32,000. And typically, it's in that 22,000 range, or is that about 23? I'd have to look that up, but yeah, that's, that's probably. So, uh, so do you tend to keep me at that level to, so that you maintain that additional 5 million storage capacity additional over 2011? We will, uh, you know, we, when we raise our, our level of service, that gives us, it basically raises the, the floor and the ceiling, both our minimum and our maximum targets, and we try to fit in that box. Right now, we're, we're not releasing 46,000 CFS from Gavin's Point because of downstream inflow. So as the downstream inflow falls off, we will increase releases out of Gavin's Point and then adjust accordingly up the system to get the water out of there. We're not going to try and maintain 5,000 or 5 million cubic feet less than 2,000 that's not a target of ours. We're, we're going to be as aggressive as we can in evacuating the flood water, but we have downstream constraints uh, on that as well. And not just downstream of Gavis Point, we have downstream of Milwaukee, downstream of Garrison constraints as well. Okay. Um, were any of you three, were you in the Omaha office in 2011? Yes, we, we were. You two were? Did you come up to here and look at what? Do a visual on site? Yes, we did. Did you? And I was up here three times and I wasn't yeah. in the water management. Okay. And, you know, uh, we can all look back and see things that we've done there. I just asked you, we're still recovering. You know, the city of here is still recovering from that. We're still doing a flood project. It costs us millions of dollars, uh, emotional stress. So we're still recovering. So I just ask you, you know, for this year again, to keep a close eye on things, keep those images in your mind, what we went through. Thanks a lot for coming up. We appreciate it. We appreciate the additional efforts that you are making. Thank you. Any other local uh, uh, government officials? Okay. Mike or Kevin, any alibis? Are you sure nobody has a question? You came all the way here through that snow and you didn't have a question to ask? All right. With that, we're adjourned. We will be around here for a few minutes if you want to talk one-on-one -on -one with any of the staff here. Thank you for coming.